Well, I think that you, you, you rightly read it. And uh, it's about manufacture. And it's also about possession of weapons without lawful authority, contrary to Section 192 of the Criminal and Adult Offenses Act of 1960. And basically, I, I think I need to shed light on, on this. That is a very, very serious charge. And people do not actually think that it is. But let me make it very clear and categorical that the charge of possession of ammunition without lawful authority is a fair degree felony. And if you are convicted on it, you can be sentenced to life in prison if, if you are found guilty of that offense. Mm-hmm. So it's a very serious offense indeed. And people uh, may, may have expected to have seen certain charges they haven't seen. But equally as serious are the charges that have been presented against the accused persons. If those charges are proved in any competent court, at the end of it, I can tell you that the maximum sentence for uh, charges under Section 192 of the Criminal Offences Act is life in prison. Because that's a first degree felony. But Mr. Pemka, those people were expecting to see some charges because of government's own communication when they said that these persons were plotting to destabilize the country, and I quote. Thank you. You know, the final decision as to what charges will be preferred against the accused persons will be the att- Office of Attorney General. And the Office of Attorney General we await the receipt of the completed docket with all the investigations and all the documents available to enable us to form an opinion as to the final charges and conclusive charges to be fed against the accused persons. And remember that a district court or a circuit court has no jurisdiction to try the matter at hand. And so for purposes of this case, if they have been remanded by a district court, then it is just for purposes of holding them until a determination is made as to the substantive charges that will be preferred against the accused person to enable them to mount their defense. So as we speak, the, I mean, that has always been the case. It's like even murder and other such serious crimes. You start it at the district court. But when the advice is proffered, then the persons are committed to stand trial at the uh, high court. So... In this particular case, if we come to a determination as an attorney general, after they have submitted to us a full duplicate docket from the police, and we do a review, a critical review, and come to a conclusive determination that the conduct of the accused persons, based on available facts and based on available evidence, amounted to an attempt to subvert the security of the state or overthrow the government, then the charges will change. Okay, mm. nutrition. It will change to treason. So, but that will only be upon receipt of the com- of completed docket and a careful review and scrutiny of sin. If we de- make that determination, the charges will change. So, the charges you, you found yesterday, remember that by our constitution, you, 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 you cannot hold an accused person beyond 48 hours without putting him before court. Okay. And you are unable to, you know, come to conclusive determination and conclude all investigations and build a docket within 48 hours. So, so then the police at that stage rightfully, well, based on available evidence to them at the point that they want to put you in court, prefer charges that they find maintainable in court against you and put you before a lower court so that when conclusive investigations have been done and the docket has been forwarded to the Office of Attorney General and determinations have been made, then the appropriate charges will then be preferred against the accused persons and they will be put before the most appropriate court to face their fate. Which evidence, Mr. Pemka, was recovered from Dr. McPalm's home as Baolishi? Yes, but that's not the only thing. You recall that the um, Honorable um, Minister for Information stated categorically the fact that there were other actors and players in this, and there were a series of meetings and all that all acting in concert to that. And you don't take just a day or two to unravel that. And so all those things that he stated at the press conference were all acts geared towards destabilizing the state. But as police continue investigations, they may uncover many other facts very relevant 
to the case. And all those things will be built into the docket. And remember, they'll be taking their statements, and all other arrested persons will be interrogated. And where need be, if there are footages and etc., it will be reviewed. So it's not just something that, and even as we speak now, you see, this matter, it, it, it may not be, it, it will not be tried summarily, you know. And even summary trials by the decision of the Supreme Court um, last year. It's not very clear that even summary trials that you arrest a person and within an hour you put a person before a judge and you start a trial, it's no longer going to be possible. You know, but even this one, it will not be by summary trial, it will be by indictment. What does that mean? By... What does that mean? Let me just explain that. You know, the summary trial is distinguishable from the, um, from the trial by indictment in one major way. The summary trial, all that you do is to prefer the charges against the person upon arrest and maybe even within 30 minutes or an hour put the person before court take his plea and those categories of cases are different from other categories now so if you have something like stealing you have assault you have causing harm you have rioting a, 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 a gamut of them you can go straight to court within an hour or two after arrest when you have preferred the charges and put the person before court, take his plea and start trial. But on the other hand, trial by indictment is quite complex and difficult. So most times you have it done in Ghana by a high court judge and seven jury, a seven member jury selected right. from among the public. Mm. And they determine your fate if it is murder. Now, if it is treason, which if they, they, we review the documents and realize that the current case is treasonable, mm -hmm. then it will be tried by three high court judges. Okay. So, so it depends on uh, the type of case right. that is before you. But mostly it is the first degree felony cases that, that are you tried them by, 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 by indictment. indictment. Right. And so in which case you are committed at the district court to mm -hmm. then stand trial at the high court. Mr. Kemka, uh, yes, what, what we'd like to know is that you, you are saying that some of these charges are informed by the evidence you have and the circumstances of the legal vacation that we have. However, do you have the evidence that was gathered from the home of Dr. McPalm at Baolishi? The statement had what was gathered from the Citadel Hospital. Do you have what was gathered from the home? Of course. But the court has been put in hold. For the Please wait. Your so you don't need to deliver the point, Please brother. Wait. Daniel, if you look at it, those are the pieces that led to the arrest and the charges that have been preferred against them. You know, otherwise, uh, uh, why were, were you not arrested or I was not arrested or any other person okay. by those people? It is because these incriminating pieces of evidence were found within their vicinity. Were there any more weapons found in Dr. McPalm's home apart from what was stated in the statement? You know, as I said, you see, let, me, let me make this clear, Daniel. It is not only just the discovery of weapons in your premises that will make you culpable of an offense to be charged. You may not have even been anywhere near where the weapons were found and you had no knowledge that the weapons were kept there. But you could have participated in conversations, schemes, and plans to hatch a scheme that will destabilize the state. That in itself is an offense, an inchoate offense of conspiracy. So you, you normally will have a situation where there are some people who conspire to commit the offense, and there are others who actually carry out the offense itself. All of them are actors in the scheme of affairs. And so you will have to charge them with conspiracy and then when it comes to the substantive charges, those who carried out the act are charged with the substantive charge. You, you understand? Right. So it, it, it involves a lot. It doesn't necessarily mean that when I come to your house and I find a gun or a knife or a cutlass or a bomb, that is the only time I can mm. charge you. You may not have anything at all in your house incriminating, but you have participated in conversations and plans hatched by others to cause confusion. But Even was there something not, incriminating in Dr. McPalm's home? Was there something incriminating in his home? I, I think, as I have, I have, I have uh, labored to tell you already, it is not just articles that have been found in a man's home. 
that are the basis for charges. And that is why you have to go read the charges very well, my brother. If you read the charges carefully, you will realize that it was informed by the evidence available to the police after the people had been arrested. Mr. Kwamka, you haven't answered the question. I have. No, I'm, I'm asking, did you find incriminating evidence, as far as you know, was evidence of possession of firearms in his home, his residence at Bawalishi? That, 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 that hasn't come to my attention. That would be within the purview of the investigators as of now. Because as I've told you, I needed to uh, respond to your, your, your request for fair, me to fair enough, educate fair the enough. public. Fair but enough. I'm not privy to that until the, the docket comes to our office. Fair and enough. I'll be seized with all the facts and I'll be able to give you a proper uh, rendition Thank you. of what actually is entailed there. But for now, what I can tell you is that the police have done their work and for the time being, they, 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 they've they come to the conclusion that these charges will hold okay. based on the piece of evidence okay. that I've gathered so far. We crave your indulgence, Mr. Kmemka, to hold on just a moment. That answers the question, actually. Um, Kofi Bentel is on the other line. He is Senior Vice President of Imani Africa. Mr. Bento, I'm reading from your Facebook wall. You say, if you understand trust as a crucial element in leadership, you will understand why the hullabaloo around the, quote, coup plotters. So is this a matter of people not trusting their leadership? Uh, good morning. There is a big element of that. And um, it's interesting how all of a sudden it's become more like comedy. You know, I mean, yesterday I was seeing pictures of people talking about the coup challenge and, you know, basically making light of the matter. And if you are, let's say, in a household and you have guardians who you respect to a certain point, even when they tell you something which is, you know, not so credible, because of the trust you have in them, you will not think that they will say a thing like this. And some of these things, trust is end, it's end over time. So I think there is a certain aspect of that in what is going on now. Unfortunately, unfortunately, I think that even what has unfolded in the last 48 hours is feeding into that lack, you know, of trust. For instance, you have a situation where a statement was released immediately. Okay, that tells you that there is some urgency to a certain issue. Agency means we have a certain focus that we are clear about the present danger that we are facing, for which reason we have to release a statement immediately. And the statement gives a clear impression that the state was under attack or was under imminent attack, and that, that attack has been foiled. And then they go further to say they've been working at this for 15 months. When you put all that together, the average person will assume that there has been a lot of work done over a long time and conclusions have been reached which are incontrovertible. Okay? Mm -hmm. Then the evidence starts coming out and we realize that, well, maybe there's a problem. Now, let me make this clear. It is not very um, useful for people to assume that um, these implements cannot do harm. You, people commit crimes with toy guns, all right? A bad gun can kill you, okay? And so whatever it is, we should just manage that aspect of things that says that, well, oh, these implements do not look like they were very potent. People can do a lot of things with very little. So that on the side, you know, we can move on. But it still matters that you will determine or you can sense the seriousness of the effort from the things or the circumstances surrounding it. And people felt that this did not look like a serious effort. Okay. All that being said, you had a follow-up where they were arraigned before a court. And information from the court is showing that even the arraignment itself created problems because certain things were not properly done. To the extent that the judges are having problems with, you know, the charges that are being profit. That is one. Number two, you have a situation where we were given an impression of an imminent coup plot. Basically, accusations of treason and then you end up in a situation where they are accused of you know or charged with you know manufacturing arms i'm saying that all these things feed into a certain perception and that is what is creating the problem causing people to you know make light of this matter let me make this point however one action can lead to a number of charges so that's a legal technicality mm -hmm. when you take one action you can walk into a room and touch somebody 
out of that simple action, you can be accused of assault, you can be accused of breaking and entering, you can be accused of, you know, harassment. And so one action can lead to many charges. So it is possible that the Attorney General is working on other charges. But again, I'm saying people will read what they are seeing, put the circumstances around it together, and then make up their minds. And the making up of their minds today, as it looks like, is that this is not a serious issue, especially if you have been working at it for 15 months. All right? Okay. So uh, it really is a bit worrying, but uh, we all have to wait and see how all these things turn out. So if I'm to understand what you're saying, you are satisfied with the explanation given by Mr. Klemka on the other line, that because of the legal vacation and the evidence available to them now, they have to go with these charges as we see them? No, I'm not satisfied. Uh, my brother Klemka is trying... And I think that he has a tough job. I'm not satisfied because I think that even at this point, there should have been indications that this was as serious as they suggested it was. And nobody forced them to suggest. And when I say them, I'm talking about the government and the information ministry putting out a certain piece of information. That statement created a certain perception and a certain expectation. And what Memka is telling us is that, well, we are still working on it. Look, even the evidence that they are putting forth, okay, Pemka knows, like I know, that when it comes to evidence, you have to collect it well. You have to process it well. I hear suggestions to the effect that even that evidence may not have been processed and collected properly. So I understand what Pemka is saying, but it is not satisfactory especially if they gave us a statement to the effect that this was prisoners or close to that. They've been working at it for 15 months, okay? And at this point, this is what they have. We can only wait, but I would think that, you know, there's a statement that the Latin statement, Festina Lente. Hasten slowly. Hasten slowly. Yeah. When it comes to processing these things, and you're talking about life imprisonment or death and people's liberties are on the line, you have to hasten, but hasten slowly because everything you do will come up to scrutiny. And under scrutiny, it is showing that things are not exactly as they were projected to be. This is a case of perception and reality not meeting, and it's creating a situation where the general populace feels that this government has been a bit too, you know, giddy in its trying to create mm. a situation. Mm. You know? And I think we should all guard against that because, indeed, any attempt is a serious matter, and you don't need much. Okay. Like somebody said, Look at 9-11, okay? They didn't need bombs to do anything, but it caused a lot of trouble. So we must give them the benefit of the doubt. But I also advise that they should observe the Festina Lente rule in this matter. So you, you said a lot, especially when it comes to what the information ministry as well could have done. But what of the Attorney General's department? Given the current circumstances, what would you rather they have done so that perhaps they could um, satisfy the, the, the anxieties of Ghanaians? Honestly, I don't think that any general department has done anything wrong. In fact, when it comes to what Penka and the AG and Co. do, they have to only work with the facts and the law. And so if even they suspect that there's more that they can do, at this point, the facts and the law is what they have to go with. And I agree with Penka when he says that even when you are processing the rest of the charges, you must know that the law does not allow you to hold the people beyond a certain point. So you can go to court with the ones that you are clear with, and then maybe you can get some sort of remand as you work on the others. So for, you know, what they did at the ages, I, I cannot mm. because I don't have all the information. Mm. Some of us have heard that there is more evidence, all right? Now, maybe there is, maybe there's not, but I believe they may have something they are working on. They have the constraint of finishing and finishing properly in a way that can stand the scrutiny of a court. Okay. So they have to take their time. But the information ministry put out a statement, which they said was urgent. They immediately released it. And the statement carried some sort of import about the nature of the crime, the time they have been using, or the time they've used, you know, to process it. And so it gave a certain impression that, look, this was cut and dry. Okay. But clearly, what the AG's office is showing is that it is not as cut and dry as we were made to believe. Mr. Benzo, hold on just a moment for me. Uh, Mr. Pemka, you have listened to Mr. Benzo's concern on the other line. Let me ask plainly, do you have any evidence you have seen that may give an indication that at this stage we are looking at a treason charge? You know, Daniel, I have, I have, as, as you have indicated, I've listened to 
Mr. Bento, and who seem to agree with some of the things I have said, even though he has his reservations as well. But let me make this very clear, that I have said it from the beginning when you called me, that we get all the facts available to do analysis and to come out with proper charges only when a duplicate docket has been forwarded to us. As I speak now, nothing of that sort has been done yet. Everything at this stage is preliminary, and it is only the investigative bodies who are doing everything possible and gathering all pieces of evidence to build that docket and bring to us. It is when we are seized with the docket and we go through that we can do a comprehensive analysis of things. You know, but as of this stage, I'm saying that the facts of the case and the charges that have been said are basically based on the evidence available. And to that extent, you cannot blame the police for all that. But when they have completed and submitted the same to us, it is for us to now make the determination of the appropriate charges at that stage, which may or may not include treason, depending on the facts of the matter. Yes. Yeah, Mr. Pemka, uh, p- pardon me for doing that there, but let me just ask that. Are you suggesting that given the evidence that is available to the Attorney General's Department, these are the only charges that can be preferred against these persons? Hold on. I have repeatedly said, maybe we are, you are not understanding me. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about that. But I'm saying that as of now, we are not seized with the file. It is the police. Remember that we are in charge of prosecution, not investigation. What evidence did you rely on to prefer these current charges? You don't have the full dockets, but what did you base the conspiracy charges on? Those charges that have been preferred Uh were not recommended. I I did not recommend that police charge them with us. We haven't gotten to that stage yet. So this was... the police who preferred those charges based on their investigations so far. Mm. Did mm. you understand? Mm. And I'm saying that it is now for them to build the docket and forward it to us so that we will then make the determination as to what are the appropriate charges that we can prefer against the accused persons. This mm. is actually preliminary. And that's what happens in all cases that uh, go to the uh, investigative bodies, be it Yoko, DNI, or the CID. They will... Uh, when they arrest you, based on the set of facts available and the evidence they have, they will quickly put up some charges against you, which are maintainable based on the facts. And then, if it is one that is indictable, they put you before a court and ask for a remand. And if the court agrees based on the facts, you are remanded, and then the docket is then built and forwarded to us to make determination. And when we have made the determination, it will then decide whether the matter should be put before a circuit court or a high court for trial based on the set of facts available. And remember, as I told you earlier, these are based on jurisdiction. If you take a murder case to the circuit court, you are completely out because you don't have jurisdiction to try that. And those determinations will then be made by the Office of Attorney General upon proper scrutiny of evidence available. Thank you very much, Joseph Pemka. That answers my question. Um, but since we have you on the line, Mr. Pemka, and also uh, Kofi Bento, who yourself are a lawyer, um, let me gets your uh, a word from you, Mr. Kemka, on a matter of very serious national importance that has popped up on the radar. As you may be aware, 1,842 people sat um, to enter the Ghana Law School and only 128 qualified. What's your take? Well, my take is that the determination was made by a team of examiners based on a marking scheme available to them and they came to that conclusion. It may be unfortunate that there are mass failures, but in every game there are rules. And if you fall out of the rules and regulations, then of course you are out of it indeed. So I will say that um, unfortunate as it is, there are certain rules and regulations that they went through, and unfortunately they could not meet the criteria. But going forward, we, have, we can continue to debate as a nation as to what exactly we want to do for ourselves. So that going forward, perhaps the the the, the, the matter we are discussing now uh, tomorrow yeah. or the next day, we may not have to discuss that again. Because this has, this is not the first time; it's very repetitive. We should be finding out from ourselves as a nation 
what has really gone wrong? Is it the standards have fallen? What is it exactly? If the debate is engendered and all of us arrive at those conclusions that will enable us to build a stronger nation, perhaps the next time the results will be much, much better. It's interesting that you mention this argument I've heard repeatedly that standards have fallen. So, um, but these guys have earned a degree, um, Mr. Pemka. They went through legal education at various schools across the country, very high standard institutions. And so you would expect that they would come with some level of quality. No? Of course. You know, some, not all, you know, some came directly from the senior high school and read uh, the four-year degree program and all that. Others also read degrees in other areas before they went into law. But as I, I, as I said, all of us went through processes before we became lawyers. We didn't sit at home and were called to the bar, of course, as you know. So it, it's a very difficult one to actually discuss because if examiners set a, criteria, a certain level of criteria that you should meet it and qualify, and you do not meet it, and therefore you're not qualified. It becomes very difficult to debate in your favor. However, I mean, you, you sympathize with the person. So it's a very difficult situation that we are in. But as um, uh, Her Ladyship, the Chief Justice, has time and again emphasized, we are out to produce quality pers- uh, lawyers in the system. And if these unfortunate developments result from our effort to produce quality lawyers, it's most unfortunate, but at least... The other alternative is to say that we should lower the standards or something of the sort. But I do not know what other alternative is available. It may be scary. Well, this is the law. And the Supreme Court decided last year that the entrance exam in itself was an illegality. It gave the General Legal Council the opportunity to pass a number, a batch through the entrance exam. And the General Legal Council sent a law to Parliament um, to legalize this entrance exam. A number of your colleagues in Parliament disagreed with this. I can point at Inu Safuseni, who said on our platform that this is wrong. Um, so where do you stand on this? Oh, but Parliament passed it. So even if the Honorable Inu said it was wrong, he's part of those who passed it. You know, Because when an act has been passed by Parliament, it is Parliament that passed it, not individuals in Parliament. And so I am part of the people who passed it because I'm a member of parliament. My individual decision, whether in support or against, will not matter now because parliament, by a majority decision, actually passed it. So what I can say is that, you see, you, even in your intro, you recall you just said that somebody went to the Supreme Court with a writ and asked for a determination that certain acts were unconstitutional. And that was the most interesting part that people haven't looked at. You know, the law is what it is, and nobody manipulates it. You make the pronouncement based on the facts available and then the law that supports those facts. No, the, the, the General Legal Council, which is the regulatory body for legal education in Ghana, for example, is presided over by her leadership, the Chief Justice. And then acts of the General Legal Council are challenged, and the Chief Justice and other panel members sit on the matter and rule that their own conduct is unlawful and unconstitutional. That tells you that the rule of law is working. And we have to go back to Parliament to put up a set of rules. There must just be a certain set of rules to guide us. We cannot operate in vacuum, you know. Otherwise, we create a certain lacuna that people will exploit. Mm. You know, I mean, very unfortunate, sad, as it is that we have only 128, as you have indicated, person out of a thousand plus who wrote. Very sad and unfortunate as it is. But still, there are people who pass the exam. What is the answer to, uh, the, uh, answer to that? Close, the fundamental reason is that however you raise the standards, there are people who will still pass anyway. So all that we have to do is that, unfortunate as it is, we still have to encourage people to, to, to go the extra mile to learn and sit up and do what is right. I mean, if you have failed this particular exam, there are channels. The, the door is not closed. If you really believe and you have the conviction that you passed, but they have said you can, you can actually uh, write an appeal for remarking. It's allowed by law normally. And if, if they remark and you pass, why not? And there have been cases in the past when people applied for remarking and they passed. 
Uh, Mr. Kremka, are you aware that those who sit for the exam have to sign an undertaking ahead of the exam that you would accept the results and you would not challenge them? Yes, that is, that is for those who are entering. But if you are already there, you can do remarking. You know, of course, that, that, those are all part of the rules. If you don't accept it, you don't write. But if you are already a student, if you are qualified, you've written the exam, you've passed, and you are in the law school, you've written and you have failed to have the right to appeal for remarking. It's allowed. But it's an ancient exam. What's the motivation to ask for a remarking if I have entered? You, you, you're talking about when you have entered as a student and you have written. I'm talking about when you've entered as a student, you've written the internal exam and you have failed. You can ask for a remark of those scripts. That's what I'm indicating. Yes, I was. I was referring to the entrance exam. In which case, that form is signed where you have to indicate that you would not challenge the results. Yes, but you see, Daniel, if somebody finds that unconscionable, so to speak, or unlawful, you, you, you challenge that in court. And let the court make a pronouncement whether or not it is lawful to tell a person to sign that whatever result comes out of an examination, he should accept it. It can be challenged. Because we are, we are in a country of rules. In a country of laws, not a country of men and might. So if you find this unquestionable or unlawful or both, you can go to court for a determination whether or not that is unlawful. And if a determination is made, the next batch of persons may not have to have such a situation. But until such a thing is done, if we allow the rule or a norm or a custom or a tradition or anything to stand, and we don't challenge it for a pronouncement by a competent court, then we allow it to stand at the end of it, or we cannot seek to complain if we have the right to challenge it and we did not challenge it. It's like, Mamga, do you know how many vacancies exist in the Ghana Law School? I cannot make that determination, even though I'm a member of the General Legal Council. I don't know the exact uh, number of vacancies that are available, but I know that, of course, the spaces are limited. What would you say, since you're a member of the General Legal Council, to a request by the public for a publication of the raw scores that the students got? That will, that will be a determination by the General Legal Council as a whole, not as an individual. So if that application is made for us, it will be determined by us, uh, presided over by Her Ladyship, the Chief Justice herself, whether or not that should be done. And if the uh, General Legal Education or the General Legal Council, we all agree, or a majority agree, why not? It will be done. But that will be subject to an application made and a review of same by the General Legal Council and determination made to that effect. But if that application were made, what would be Joseph Pemke's position on it? When we get to the bridge, we will cross my bed. I must say, I, I whispered to myself that I expected this answer. But Mr. Pemke, let, let me ask you honestly. Did you write an entrance exam when you were going to law school? I did not. When I got my LLB in Legon, I filled the form and I went to the law school. And remember, at the time, we had only two faculties of law in, in, in the country. The one at Tech and then the one in Lego. They were the only two. And the number of students coming from both places could be admitted to the law school or space. But now we have more than 10 institutions in the country running the LLB program. So the number of people who are coming out every year having LLB completely outstripped the number of vacancies available or the infrastructure available to accommodate them in the law school. So that answers my earlier question because it's down to a matter of lack of space. Yes, but in spite of the fact that there's lack of space, you also know that there's an entrance exam, as I indicated, and you have to pass that before you go in. You know, And if you pass the entrance exam, you move it. But if you don't pass the entrance exam, that's unfortunate. You're not going into the law school. But previously, it wasn't the case, as I said, because the, the, there was capacity to admit everybody who had LLB at the time. Mr. Kpemka, do you have 1,820 spaces in the Ghana Law School for fresh entrants? I cannot confirm nor deny that, but I don't think that we have up to that space as we see. We don't have that space. Going by your answer, yes. if all of these 1,820 students made the pass mark, what do we do? We would have had to perhaps create contingency measures to accommodate them. Of course, when we as a government 
we implemented the very popular and respected free senior high school policy. And we realized that we ran into difficulties based on the numbers that were coming. We had to introduce the double track system to accommodate them. So if you have a situation where, I mean, that is, that is uh, to the stretch of any imagination, you have about 1,800 passing to enter there, then there have to be contingency measures that will actually accommodate them without denying anybody after the person has passed the exam. I'm curious because last year, the Ghana Law School admitted 500 students. This year, it's 128. Are we failing people because we don't have space? That's not correct at all. You know, as I said, it's the same standards that are being set and the examiners are marking the scripts. But remember that there are not going to be 128 people in the class, in that class. Because uh, those who were admitted last year, a lot of them did not pass to go to the second year. And so those are going to repeat. In addition to others who were repeated two years ago, who still could not pass. So you're going to end up having quite uh, a big number in the first year, even though those who may have passed are just 128. But, um, so you're saying that we are going to have a large number of first years, but not necessarily from the 1,820 who wrote the exam. Not, I, I have not used the word large, but I'm saying that it is definitely going to be more than the 128 because others were repeated. And so the 128 will join those who were repeated to make up the first year class. Mr. Bentil is still with us on the other line. Um, uh, Mr. Bentil, interesting conversation we are having. Yeah, and I am listening and I hear my brother Penka really trying, but this thing is terrible. It's tragic. And already this morning I've had a call from, you know, someone who is like, what do I do? Okay, and much as Penka is trying, you ask some very important questions. And for the sake of the public, I think we must, you know, um, stay on those ones. Point number one, it is not true that these young men and women writing these exams are not qualified for the law school. It's not true. That's point number one. Point number two, if you have an examination which is preset to exclude people regardless of how well they do, then that is patently unfair. And that is what Femka had been alluding to. Because the question you ask is this. If it's an examination, then what it means is that theoretically, technically, everybody can pass. And if that examination was really meant to bring out people who could pass and then give them spaces, then it means they must have the number of spaces there in the law school according to the number of people who are writing the exam, because theoretically they can all pass. But Benka has just told you, we don't have the spaces. In all kinds of you know, discussions on this matter, it's been made very clear that the entrance exam is directly designed to exclude people because there is a problem with space. Okay, That tells you that the government, and I don't mean just this government, but governments up till now. And this government has failed, refused, and neglected to deal with this problem. The government is throwing away qualified young people. And all they ask is that you just play your part, do your work to give them space to learn. And we've been around this. You made the point that the Supreme Court determined this was illegal. Then you go to court to go and change that law to make it legal. As we speak, even when you put the current practice under scrutiny, people will be found wanting. Examinations must be transparent and fair. If you subject this particular examination to all kinds of you know, um, um, examination rules and whatever, you realize that they are not fair. Especially look at the situation where you are going into an exam and you are made to sign an undertaking that whatever happens to you, you are not going to challenge it. What system is that? So look, let me just make these points simple. This is a failure of leadership. We have sat down. We have not done better than what Kwame Nkrumah did many, many years ago. And when we are called upon to do so, we visit the problem on our hapless and poor young men and women. Today, people are paying thousands of pounds to run out of this country to go and learn law. There is nothing super fantastic about the law school and the law course that they lend there, which is more than medicine or more than ACCA or more than ICA. And there is no reason why 
our leaders cannot create the room we need. It's been done in Legon before, and I think we can have at least 10 universities in this country. University um, of uh, UPSA, Professional Studies, is capable. I have checked with them. I have gone there. I have done my research, and there are many universities, at least 10, capable of running the law course. Why are they not just allowing our young people to learn? This is a leadership crisis. It's been shown, proven many times. And I urge Pemka to put his energies towards resolving it instead of really packing up a series of excuses. He's trying, but it's not going to work. Every year, up to last two years, we had 3,000 people we have thrown out. And every year we are adding to the number. Why frustrate people for no good reason? That examination is a travesty. It is wrong. And posterity will judge the leaders of today if they fail to put their energies towards solving it. Right now they are giving us excuses. Mr. Benzo, um, we would have to leave this here for now, but um, let me go back to Mr. Pemka for his final comments. Thank you very much, Kofi Benzo, for joining us. Thank you. Daniel, we are very grateful for the opportunity to... Mr. Pemka, I, I was thinking that you would want to make a, a final comment on this matter. Well, my, my final comment would be that um, in, in discussing this, um, we should do it without emotions, and we should have a sober reflection and look at what are the alternatives. Let's debate the issues and continue to debate it from here. But we shall definitely get over it as time goes on. That's what I would say to Ghanaians. And that we, we should just be patient with one another as we struggle to build a nation. Because once upon a time, it wasn't like that. We've gotten this far because of the issue of numbers, mm. which is so fundamental in every democracy. As we grow, these things will come up. But I believe that God willing, 10 years from now, this may not be a topic anymore because measures will be put in place after a holistic debate has been made and decisions taken, far-reaching indeed, that will ensure that that land we are struggling to get to will all get there. That's what I'm saying. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity to contribute this morning to a national debate on this issue. Uh, given to me by uh, another I, I, I'm going to hold your leg on radio, uh, Ms. Akmemka, because I, I just heard something that I, I just have to touch on. So I have two questions. I'll ask my first one. Is our Chief Justice too powerful? I, I don't understand that. <laughs> she's the head of the General Legal Council, and she's the head of the Supreme Court. In the case that you mentioned as a beautiful display of the rule of law, she actually sat as a judge in her own court. I mean, with the greatest of respects to Justice Mrs. Sophia Ekofo. Yes, and the determination that was made, did it serve her interest? Whose interest does it serve if ultimately? It, it, served, it served the interest of justice. As far as I know, her leadership, the Chief Justice, she's a very, 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 very principled and strong judge. And I have no doubt about that. I can vouch for that as I know her. And she's one person who does not compromise on quality. That I know about her and I can vouch for her. Yes. Um, my, my other question would be, you said that in three years this will not be a problem because some measures will be put in place. What measures? I said that as we move forward, Measures will be put in place to ensure that some of these things do not recur. And as I've actually indicated, do a follow up to the law school and talk to the director of law school. You will realize that uh, the General Legal Council has had this action and come to certain conclusions and given the go ahead for construction of uh, infrastructure to in increase the intake and fund mm. uh, the, the law school and all that. And that, these are part of the measures that have indicated. Once it uh, has been done and more spaces are created, if, for example, maybe past mark was 10, it may be reduced in order to increase the numbers. That's what I'm saying. So it, it all depends. These measures that are being taken, it, it isn't that the delegates are just sitting by raising all hands in despair in the air. No, that's not it at all. What actually is happening is that measures are being put in place to ensure that some of the problems that have been identified in legal education are addressed so that um, it doesn't escalate to something that nobody imagines. Joseph Dindiok Pemka, we are very grateful that you joined us today. I'm humbled to have heard from you. Thank you. Thank you. He's Deputy Attorney General. Um, he's in charge of criminal prosecutions. First of all, we had a great conversation about the three suspected coup plotters. I'm putting that in quotation marks. I'm quoting government statement and...
the charges that were eventually preferred against them. He says, look, the charges of conspiracy to uh, manufacture arms and illegal possession of arms were preferred against them by the police. Now, remember that Kojo Ponkoma, information minister, told us that it is the security agencies who told the government that the current evidence they have points to destabilizing the country. But it's the same security agency, the police, that preferred charges of illegal possession of arms and manufacture of arms. So, it's a bit of a, a contradiction there. I guess that's an answer that they can give. However, he says that if they have more evidence, when they get the final dockets, they'll make a determination on which charge to prefer against these three persons, whether or not it's possession of arms or treason. And then we moved on to the conversation about the 128 students who passed out of an exam written by 1,820 people. This could have been a problem if they were writing to enter and fan swim school or Wesley Girls High School, which has options. But this is the Ghana Law School. There's only one in the country and it's run by the uh, by the country. And um, we don't have enough lawyers anyway. Even if all of these people pass, we won't have enough lawyers. So what's the real problem? Mr. Pemka says, it suggests that it's probably a lack of space. But I'm asking you, do you think it's a lack of space or is a poor quality of students or both? 128 pass out of 1,820 students. Is this a lack of a case of lack of space or poor quality of students or both? We'll be back to get that answer from you. Welcome to 21st Century Service Provision. Need to pay your ward school fees? Thanks, Daddy. Want to flex that girl? Wow, he's so cool. <laughs> Grandma needs airtime to fill me in on all the village filler. Hey, me be a guy. Or you're just tired of having to hop from app to short codes to website and back. Welcome to the new phase of buying, selling, and connecting with customers. Welcome to convenience and technology. Welcome to my GH Pay, mygHPay.com. Make or receive payments online from anywhere using a Visa card, MasterCard, GH Link card, or your mobile money wallet. Businesses, associations, institutions can get listed for free today and enjoy a new world of convenience. Download my GH Pay for free from Play Store and App Store. MyGHPay.com. Buy, sell, and connect. The platform for everyone. Ma, please, give me your phone. Let me make a quick call. So you're still on that network that gives you fear, data, and talk time. When Vodafone has double the red one, red two, and red five offers eh? for five CDs, Chikra. You get 250 minutes to call all networks, hey. 250 megabytes data, and more. I'm moving to Vodafone today. <laughs> Switch to Vodafone to enjoy double into swore on red bundles of one, two, and five CDs. Enjoy double talk minutes to call all networks. Networks and double data to browse. Vodafone always gives you more. Dial star 200 hash to subscribe now. Terms and conditions apply. The future is exciting. Ready? Comfort, durability, finishing, quality. Choosing sofas and beds for your home, office or hotel couldn't be easier with an exclusive range of sofas and beds in various designs and colors from Latex Foam. There is so much choice whatever your budget. Latex Foam, your partner for life. Boss man, I'm at the bank. Really? But your car is in front of your house. Bro, my bank on my phone, Charlie. Oh, how? Ecobank, bro. With Ecobank Mobile app, I can do everything, anywhere, anytime. Listen, I just checked my account balance, paid Amen school fees, and sent money to my grandma at Wale Wale. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Masa, just download the Ecobank Mobile app from the Google Play Store or the App Store or dial star 770 hash and be your own bank manager. Manager, manager. Whether to pay bills or fees, to check account statements, Send money across Ghana, abroad, and more. Ecobank Mobile app has got it covered. Ecobank Mobile, making everyday people live everyday lives the Ecobank way. Ecobank, the Pan African bank. 
Enjoy fast, affordable, and dependable 4G service in Accra and Tema, in your office, home, or on the go. Contact Telesol today on 0302-221-658 or 9 or 0303-975-342 or 4 or our website, telesol4g.com or send us an email through enquiry at telesol4g.com. Telesol 4G, just a touch. Are you tired of driving around just to find a travel agent? Or are you that person who calls your travel agent only to hear the phone say? Oh, okay, sorry, we don't close. If you call us tomorrow for booking. <laughs> or you be that person where they make last many travel arrangements? Don't worry no more because Malcolm Travels gives you the opportunity at your own convenience to make your own travel bookings anywhere, anytime, 24 7. Oh, yeah, at Malcolm Travels, we give you the best travel deals anytime, anywhere on your mobile phone. Charlie, the days of Wahala and late travel bookings are over. Jack, what are you waiting for? Just log on to www.malcomtravels.com and make your own bookings now. Malcolm Travels. Booking anytime, anywhere at your own convenience. Just log on www.malcomtravels.com. So you wanted that weave, that one that so long it touches your toes. Got it. A disco light for the room when the sweetheart comes over. Swoon your matrona. Bug debt. Those chrome swinging wheels that will have people at church praying to be you. <laughs> but them. Now, how about those mega woofers that will wake up the whole neighborhood? Audit. Because you've got the card that makes it all possible. You don't need a bank account to spoil yourself. You can now securely load funds for travel, pay for goods and services online and at your favorite shop, or give your loved ones unending spending options or possibilities with a perfect gift card. Get a Cowbank prepaid card now, because you can. Cowbank, for together. Coffee in your cup and joy on the set. The Super Morning Show is always the best bet on Joy 99.7 FM. Ten minutes at the top of the others, the Super Morning Show on Joy 99.7 FM. I'm opening the phone lines for you in just a second. 0302216541024434037. I want to ask you, 